spiritual awakening, he decided to hey, what's up? his personal preferences uh, and simply let yeah. call the shots. I'm A singer takes you on the actually watching this video I recorded two months ago. Um, that was my last time reading this book. I don't know, man. Um, I have read this book many times, but I only I think I only recorded myself reading this book for once. And I left this book at my grandparents' place, so every time I just didn't record myself reading it. I just read it myself without recording. This sounds kind of weird to me now because I used to be just reading a lot book just by myself and my family can hear it. I never thought I would read, I mean, read to the camera. I never thought of recording them and publishing them online. And now I just feel like, man, I should have done this a long time ago. Like, I started discovering this passion for reading book loud when I was in middle school reading English books but not those these kind of books this is too difficult for me back then but I was reading some like Li Yang crazy English book those are not even real books I mean not like famous or whatever those are just like students study them to take the exams the English exams um yeah but that was my sparkle yeah for this passion um, okay I'm gonna spend I don't know probably 20 some minutes as a euro to read this book by Michael A. Singer The Surrender Experiment yeah I I don't know I'm gonna just read this part on page 48 chapter 8 uh, chapter 12 when the disciple is ready the master appears other than for school work reading books had never played a major role in my life Whoa. <laughs> Okay, it sounds like my story because, yeah, as I said, I was only reading like the text, I mean, test prepare, test preparation booklets, the young crazy English. Those are not real books, not this, okay? But let me continue. But just as three pillars of Zen had shown up exactly when I was ready for it. So another book has found its way to me just before I moved into my house. It was given to me by Bob Merrill, a friend of mine who, like me, was very much into yoga and meditation. One day, while I was still living in my van, Bob gave me the book called Autobiography of Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, a holy man from India. I remember trying to start this book the evening Bob had given it to me, but after a few pages I had to put it down. Not because I didn't like it, but because each word I read kept drawing me into such a deep meditative state that I couldn't continue reading. I tried again the next night. The same thing happened. I didn't understand what was going on, but I was suddenly intrigued by the experience. I decided to pack the book away until I moved into my new house now that I had to move into the house and started my intense meditative lifestyle, it was time to read this mysterious book. Chapter after chapter transported me into a world that should have been very foreign to me, but because of the transformative events that had been happening to me, I could at least relate to the Indian saint's life story. It became very clear to me. I had merely stuck my toe into the ocean Yangananda was swimming in. He was a master of the entire field of knowledge and experience I was seeking. I could feel it to the core of my being. Yogananda had gone far beyond my beyond and had never fully come back. He had learned to exist in that state, 
yet still be present interacting with the world, I found my teacher. Even though I felt an immediate sense of relief that I was no longer alone on my inner journey, some areas of tension had been worked out. To begin with, the word God was not part of my everyday vocabulary. Young Nanda not only used the word as freely as his breath flowed, but he used it with a sense of intense devotion that both took your breath away. Yogananda's passion showed most in the songs that he wrote. My heart's a flame and my soul's a fire just for you. 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 Just you. Interestingly, I could relate to that. Since I had touched that beauteous place deep inside of me, my heart was a flame too. In fact, I had lost interest in everything else. I only wanted to meditate my way back beyond myself. I could relate to God as associated with that place hidden deep inside of me. My study of Zen taught me that Buddha passed through absolute stillness and peace of, on his way into Nirvana. I had heard that Christ said that the kingdom is within you, and I was aware that the Bible talked about peace beyond all understanding. I knew about such a place inside of me where the peace was so deep that I had completely transformed my entire life. Another word that I couldn't relate to at first was spirit. I thought this was a Christian word, yet Yagananda used it all the time. He spoke of invoking the spirit and feeling it pulsate through him. He related times when he held up his hands and felt the spirit move into and out of them. Could he be referring to that powerful flow of energy I had been experiencing things my very deep meditation? I often felt that field of energy flow from the point between my eyebrows, down my arms, and out the center of my palms. Could spirit be another word for this inner energy flow? And could that focal point between my eyebrows be the location of what Yangnanda kept calling the third eye or spiritual eye? More and more I began to realize that I could personally relate to Yangnanda's teachings. Autobiography of a yogi changed my view about everything that had been happening to me. Once I finished reading that book, God was no longer just a word to me. It represented where I wanted to go. I had begun this I had begun this journey by wanting to know who I was, who was watching the mental voice. I now realized that the great saints and masters of all the religious traditions had gone beyond their personal self to find their spiritual self. Yangananda called it self-realization. What a perfect term for all I was about at that point of my life. I wanted to realize the nature of the one who watches, my true innermost self. Bob Merrill had told me that he received lessons from Self-Realization Fellowship, the organization Yangananda had founded in America. Yangananda had left the body in 1952 but he had been kind enough to leave his teachings behind in the form of weekly lessons. I had heard of a male order bride, but never a male order guru. I signed up for the lessons immediately and integrated them into my regular practices. I remember that around that time I decided to read the Bible. I had never read the New Testament before. I found it very inspiring, and so much of the teachings were completely aligned with what I had been experiencing in meditation. For example, there was the notion that you have to die be, to be reborn. That is exactly what I had been trying to do. Die of the personal to be reborn in the spiritual. I put pictures of Christ and Yogananda on the altar where I meditated. Some very great beings had walked in these paths before me. I wanted to learn from them. I was just starting to realize that I couldn't walk the path alone. I needed some help. Oh, my goodness. I loved it. Okay, I think this is the end of the section one. Now we're gonna begin the section two. The great experiment begins. Chapter 13 The Experiment of a Lifetime. Thus far, my entire path to inner freedom was focused around my meditations. That was where I went to become filled with a deep sense of peace and serenity. Okay, somebody's walking towards me with loud voice. 
Okay. I'm kind of loud too. I'm at a public space, and I mean, it's almost noon, so I don't think it's a problem. Yeah. And this is the only place that I can record a video because the lights, yeah, the lights was not even on. So, all right. Let me keep going. And it was working to a degree. I could sit for hours with a beautiful flow of energy lifting me upward, but I couldn't break through to where I longed to go. Furthermore, the personal mind always returned once I got up and became active. I needed help, and it came one day in a flash of realization. It dawned on me that perhaps I had been going about this in the wrong way. Instead of trying to free myself by constantly quieting the mind, perhaps I should be asking why the mind is so active. What is the motivation behind all the mental chatter? If that motivation were to be removed, the struggle would be over. This realization opened the door for an entirely new and exciting dimension to my practices as I explored it inwardly. The first thing I noticed was that most of the mental activity revolved around my likes and dislikes. If my mind had a preference toward or against something, it actively talked about it. I could see that it was the, these mental preferences that were creating much of the ongoing dialogue about how to control everything in my life. In a bold attempt to free myself from all that, I decided to just stop listening to all the chatter about my personal preferences and instead start the willful practice of accepting what the flow of life was presenting me. Perhaps this change in focus would quiet things down inside. Wow, so powerful. I loved it. This is literally something I need to read. Like last night, I was like having a hard time to sleep after I got woke up by some other people's talk. But I just got a lot of mental chatter and I couldn't quiet them down. And But I realized, I know, I'm aware. I was aware that I shouldn't really think that way. I should um, dig deeper. What is behind, what is what is the reason what is the motivation that i have those voices keep appearing in my mind and yeah i realized i do i do have a lot of things that bother bothered uh, me mentally and so um i just really need to learn and practice more this uh experiment yeah and it will help me a lot to become more zen and peaceful um, it is very helpful in terms of mental health and daily efficiency I guess page 54 I started this new practice with something very simple the weather could it really be so hard to just let it rain when it rains and be sunny when it's sunny without complaining about it apparently the mind can't do it why did it have to rain today? It always rains when I don't want it to. It had all week to rain. It's just not fair. I simply replaced all that meaningless noise with, look how beautiful, it's raining. Whoa, I love this. I, I always do that to myself. Whenever something unpleasant happens, that made me kind of, yeah, unpleasant. I would just remind myself. Okay, change your perspective. Resist it. Complain at it, be a bitch about it. Instead, I would, oh, I love it. Oh, how, how beautiful is that? I love it. Awesome, it's all good, yeah. I would tell myself that. And then I would feel immediately much better. Yeah, it's definitely working to me. Okay, I found these practices of acceptance very powerful and they definitely serve to, to quiet the mind. So I decided to push the envelope and broaden the range of events I would learn to accept. I clearly remember deciding that from now on, if life was unfolding in a certain way, and the only reason I was resisting it was because of a personal preference. I would let go of my preference and let life be in charge. Clearly, these were uncharted waters for me, where I would end up. If my preferences were not leading me, what would happen to me? Those these questions did not scare me. They fascinated me. I didn't want to be in charge of my life. I wanted to be free to soar far beyond myself. 
I began to see this as a great experiment. What would happen to me if I just inwardly surrendered my resistance and let the flow of life be in charge? The rules of the experiment were very simple. If life brought events in front of me, I would treat them as if they came to take me beyond myself. If my personal self complained, I would use each opportunity to simply let him go and surrender to what life was presenting me. This was the birth of what I came to call the surrender experiment, and I was totally prepared to see where it would take me. You may think that only a madman would make such a decision, but in truth, I had already experienced some amazing things that the flow of life had done. I had witnessed firsthand what happened when I let go and followed the subtle events that led me to the hills of Mexico and then to those wonderful experiences with the Mexican villagers. Okay. When I got back to the States, I had been led to my beautiful new property. And look what happened with that house. I just wanted to build a simple hut and that turned into an unexpectedly rich experience. It was clear to me that I had not done the, these things. They had happened to me. In fact, if I had not let go of my initial mental resistance, none of them could have happened. I had gone through most of my life thinking I knew what was good for me, but life itself seemed to know better. I was now going to test that presumption of non-randomness to the max. I was willing to roll the dice and let the flow of life be in charge. Oh yeah. I think the key is, you have to understand, you can't personally decide a lot of things for your life. You have to just follow the flow of life. Like the weather, uh, people you're gonna meet, um, whatever, man. Just You simply have to learn how to accept everything that will happen to you. Whether you want it or not, whether you resist it or not, you have to accept them. Yeah, as I said, as I mentioned in my last video, this is such a coincidence because I talked about these topics like in my last video and now I'm reading this again. This is like, yeah, this is the same thing. Like, you never know what would happen. You gotta just like let go, let go, and then life know better. Life knows better than we do you know what i'm saying you have to trust it you have to accept it you have to welcome them and then beautiful things happen okay all right real quick i gotta say bye because my camera probably it's overheated thank you for watching this keep reading more great book all right bye